So, uh, in our um, confession of faith class, we are going to like a sort of different mode of study. Um, having already taught in the past, um, paragraph by paragraph through chapter one of the confession, I was able to do the presentation that I did in previous weeks, which I think was good because the doctrine of Scripture is foundational. And I wanted to make sure we, we dotted the I's and crossed the T's, and we could actually say much more, but I wanted to make sure we got our doctrine of Scripture right, so that as we now do theology, we would truly derive what we believe from the careful exegesis of the Scriptures, right? And when you look at the shape of our confession of faith, um, you could even say that the way that it flows actually teaches you how to be a good theologian, okay? A good theologian needs a high view of the scriptures. You need to know the Word of God. You need to know what the Word of God is. You need to know its sufficiency. You need to have these convictions as you approach it so that you could be a good student of the scriptures. And then, as you read the scriptures, who is the main character of the Bible? Yeah, God, God in Christ. Christ Jesus, who is God in the flesh, or if you want to just be upfront and more general, uh, God. God is the main character of the Bible. There are only, re- you could categorize everything that now exists into two things creation and creator. The Bible opens with the words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there you have a summary of, of everything. There is God, and then there is creation, okay? And doing theology is really um, seeking to understand and know God, and then all things in relation to God. So why do we need to develop our doctrine of God very well and biblically? Well, it's because if you get the doctrine of God wrong, you get all things in relation to God wrong as well. If you get the doctrine of God wrong, you don't understand who He is as Creator, you will immediately have a skewed view of creation. So that brings us to chapter 2 of the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is of God and the Holy Trinity. So this Cover, this is the entire chapter in your piece of paper. On the left, you have the modern English version that we've been using, <clears throat> together with um, some footnotes and the scripture proofs. On the right, you have the original, lang- uh, the original uh, language, the original English of the confession, first penned in 1677, and then publicly affirmed by many churches in 1689. Um, Quite similar, but of course, most people have an easier time reading the modern English. But I do want us to have the original English in hand because there are some insights when it comes to older ways of speaking that I think might be very helpful for our task. Now, on the back, on the back of the paper, you have a breakdown of this chapter, okay? We're going to go through it like a nice little Bible study using the confession as an aid to biblical studies, right? And look, whatever we cover today, that's what we cover today. And then whatever we cover next week, that's what we cover next week. But I need something from you. Do not lose your piece of paper, okay? That is what I require of you, dear students. I know it's a very difficult task. But please, try not to lose your piece of paper, okay? And if you don't have a piece of paper, who doesn't have a piece of paper? Yes, okay, everybody has a piece of paper? Pretty much, good. Um, Take out a pen, you can write notes into it, you can put it in your notebook, do whatever, but this in the back is a breakdown, a detailed breakdown of chapter two. I wanna remind you that I'm not trying to be original. There are brilliant and godly men that are are alive today and have gone before us that have done some excellent work um, expositing the confession. I'm indebted to um, Sam Waldron's exposition of the confession, and I took his I took his outline, but then I changed it as well to, in, in, in my view, to make it more understandable to you guys. Um, I'm drawing from Dr. James Renahan's exposition uh, of the confession. 
Um, there is a pastor in the U.S., a Reformed Baptist pastor named Alan Dunn, who has done some great pastoral and devotional work on this chapter of the Confession. I'm drawing from that as well. All of that to say, I'm not being original, okay? So if you go, oh, wow, yeah, that's some great insight, okay? No, don't thank me. Um, I am not original. So here we are, chapter two of God, the Holy Trinity. Three paragraphs. The first paragraph, um, well, we could simply say it speaks of who God is, the attributes of God. The second paragraph is about God the creator in relation to his creatures. And then paragraph three is about God the Trinity. He is triune. So this is the triune God in relation to his own self. Okay, so who God is, the attributes of God, what he is, and then the creator God in relation to his creatures, and then the triune God in relation to himself. That's a nice, neat little summary. So let's go to paragraph one. And since everybody has a copy, and I know I try to fit it all together so it's quite small, um, I would like us to read from the modern English version together. Ready? Let us read. The Lord our God is one, the only living and true God. He is self-existent and infinite in being and perfection. His essence cannot be understood by anyone but Him. He is a perfectly pure spirit. He is invisible and has no body, parts, or changeable emotions. He alone has immortality, dwelling in light that no one can approach. He is unchangeable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, in every way infinite, absolutely holy, perfectly wise, wholly free, completely absolute. He works all things according to the counsel of his own unchangeable and completely righteous will for his own glory. He is most loving, gracious, merciful, and patient. He overflows with goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. He rewards those who seek him diligently. At the same time, he is perfectly just and terrifying in his judgments. He hates all sin and will certainly not clear the guilty. That is paragraph one. What a beautiful summary of the doctrine of God, of the attributes of God. You'll notice as well that a lot of the phrases are simply drawn uh, directly from Scripture. He's dwelling in light that no one can approach. That's the way that Paul speaks of him. Uh, when he speaks of God as forgiving iniquity, transgressions, and sins, and so on, we think of God's revelation of himself to Moses and to Israel as, as the God who is faithful to the, a thousand generations, who is filled with long suffering, that is, patience, loving kindness, and mercy, but also will not neglect to punish sins and will certainly visit the people who have sinned against him in acts of judgment. So what we have here is a nice little summary of the biblical doctrine of God. The first phrase begins with, the Lord our God is one, or in the original English, the Lord our God is but one only living and true God. The, the title, the living God, is, is all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, and we are getting this, the Lord our God is but one, that is clearly taken from where? Anybody know where? It's taken from, yeah, the Shema, yes? Where is that? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's called uh, the Shema, because they the hear, Shema Israel, they say, and it's something that many Jews would know, they would know until this day. Our catechism asks the question, are there more gods than one? Well, of course not. Or the children's catechism, how many gods are there? One. There is only one God. So if you look, um, I know, now I'm like wishing that maybe we just should have had two pieces of paper, because now you have to do this. Oh well, um, if you look at the outline, we begin, when it comes to the attributes of God, with the singularity of God. Now, guys, when we, we'll get into this in a moment, but when we speak of the attributes of God, we're not talking about different shades, or different parts, or different pieces of God. 
so that when you take these parts and pieces and put them all together, you get God. No, we are uh, talking about the biblical revelation of who God is and using human language, um, it is necessary for us to speak of his many attributes when the truth is, he is completely one, he's completely love, he's completely infinite, he's completely sovereign. He is all of these things at the same time. There are not different pieces of him. He's not more of one thing than he is the other. I'm, I'm getting into the doctrine of simplicity, but we're not there yet, okay? Um, we're about to get there. So, firstly, singularity. Only one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is only one God. If you want um, to look at some of the verses that we would cite, such as Isaiah 46, verse 9. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Okay. Now, there's one God and there's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, 5. That is clear as well, but Scripture is... Very clear, I'm sure nobody would argue with this, at least if you're serious and Bible-believing. There's only one God. Now, there are false gods. There are idols. And many of these idols that people worship, like in the Bible, uh, when people were worshiping statues, come on, we all know that those statues aren't actually alive, right? They're not living beings. And so our confession goes on to say, the Lord our God is one, the only living and true God. Living. Our God is alive. As opposed to the pagan idols who Psalm 115 calls dead. The pagan idols are dead. In contrast, we've got the living God. And all of life, actually comes from Him. All of life flows from Him. He is life. He is called the living God. Psalm 84, verse 2. And so when we speak of the God of the Scriptures, we're not speaking of just a concept. We're speaking of a real, living being who is life Himself. He's only one. He is living, and then He is true. He is the true God, as opposed to false gods. So, there is a living God, quote-unquote, that stands behind false idols, false gods, idols. There is a living small g God, if you will, that stands behind polytheism, do you know who that is? Yes. And he's alive? Who is he? Yeah, who is the living small g God that really stands behind every dead idol and every act of false worship and all of polytheism? The Satan. The Satan, yes, very good. That's right. He is not the true God. He is a false God of many. Now, depending on your interpretation of 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, maybe you could say Satan is the god of this world. Some people have different interpretations of that. But Satan is a false god, and all of false worship ultimately is really being rendered to Satan. Okay? But the Lord is the one true god. Um, Jeremiah 10.10, 10, He is the living God and the everlasting King, but the Lord is the true God. Jeremiah says, okay? He's not a false god. He's not an idol made in the image of men. You see, this is at the heart of idolatry. Uh, the biblical God, 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 the God of the scriptures is a God who makes human beings in his own image and likeness. The God of the idolaters are gods that they make in their own image and likeness. They're much more like them like the gods of the pagans who actually get hungry, the gods of the pagans that need our service in order for them to function. Uh, just like we might own a plot of land, many of the false gods, they're only gods over a specific geographical territory. 
That's how it was in the days of the Old Testament when paganism was spreading. But not this God. He is the only one. He is the living God. He is the true God. The singularity of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Um, any, any thoughts, any questions on this singularity of God? Mm. How can we describe him as a being if he is not simply a being among beings? Well, he is not a being among beings because as scripture says, all of life and being derives its being from God. He is the being. He, before him, there is no God, neither there sh shall there be after him, and there is no existence outside of being derived from the life of God. Everything flows from him. So uh, you're getting into the creator-creature distinction, which is good, right? Um, we speak of God as a being, and then you look at me, I am a human being. So one could easily then say, God's one kind of, he's a being, and then I'm a being. It's almost like we are, we are equals. No, this is, this is a very different kind of being because he actually stands over and above all of creation, and all that exists finds its being in him. Uh, of course, saying that not in a, um, what do you call it, when the world is part of God? A pantheistic uh, way. Yes. So, yes. Did you do that? No. Uh, next. Sorry? Um, I, I've got a question. Um, yeah. About the simplicity of God. You said, um, yes, and we will get there. Okay. <laughs> yes, we'll get there when we get to spirituality. So next, independence. Okay, this speaks of God's self-existence or his aseity. Okay, this, this goes back to the question that was just asked. Everything that exists is derived from God. It, our being is dependent upon God, okay? All of us as human beings is dependent on something that already exists prior to us in order for us to exist. But when it comes to God, nothing exists prior to God. So how does he exist? Well, he didn't come into existence. He is fully independent, self-existent, and if you want to get technical, this is the doctrine of God's aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y, aseity. In our confession says, reading from the older English, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection. Uh, if you, and the modern English just renders it, he is self-existent and infinite in being and perfection, okay? This is the or historic, orthodox understanding of God. And our confession is being very much historic in that sense. So we've got a unique being who is transcendent. And what do, you mean, what do you mean by subsistence? Well, this is speaking of God's very own existence, okay? So there are actually, if you could say it this way to that question earlier, two orders of being. The being of creator, and then the being of being created. Two distinct orders of being. The being of creator, which is unique, he's transcendent, he is self-existent, but then there's everything else, which is the being of the created. So our God exists completely independent of anything in creation. He is not dependent on anything to be alive. That's what we mean when we talk about his self-existence. On the other hand, oh, okay, for example, John 5, 26, for just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son to have life in himself. You hear that? For the Father has life in himself. On the other hand, Acts 17, 28, in him we move and we breathe and we find our being. Okay? So when it comes to God, his being is found in himself. His existence, his life is in himself. When it comes to creatures, when it comes to us, we derive all life from him. We are utterly dependent upon him, even for our very own 
existence. Our being is dependent upon the being of God. God can exist and does exist even if nothing else exists. We cannot exist without the being of God, without God. And so we're also saying then that he is independent of all of his creatures. Now that he's created, he's not dependent upon creation in any way, right? Again, going back to the pagan conceptions of their deities, a lot of their deities, they're actually pretty dependent on the people, right? And the way that they do the religious services, it's like, hey, if you don't bring the food, if you don't burn the stuff, if you don't sacrifice enough children and so on, what's, the, what's Molech and what's Baal and what's all of these guys? What are they gonna eat? Hey, you gotta feed your gods, right? Uh, God is completely independent of us. Think about, note this down, Exodus 3, verse 14, when God introduced himself to Moses, what did he say? I am. am. He is the great I am. I am that I am. I am who I am. I am and I will will be. I always will be. Um, You know the Hebrew letters, the, the, the Y-H-W-H in English, right? Yahweh. Uh, It's under the Old Covenant. It's clearly God's revealed name. And this word is so closely associated to, to the word for to be. To be. I am. God is the one who is, the self existing one. The best, most accurate way to define what God is is that God is. That's who He is. That's what he is. He is. And, and what we're talking about right now, this is, this is foundational to understanding his attributes. All that God is, this, I'm quoting Alan Dunn here, all that God is and does is accomplished with transcendent self-sufficiency. When he does something powerful in the world, he didn't need to, to, to plug in and charge. Oh, I got tired doing all that creation stuff. I need to back off a little bit, take a breather, and then I can do some more amazing providence stuff. He doesn't do amazing miracles in this world and then derive that strength or power from his creatures. No, he performs all his holy will independently of his creatures. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Romans eleven thirty six. Questions on the independence of God, or points you wanna you wanna share? We're, we're studying together here, hypothetically. Yes. Does God create Himself? No, God does not create Himself. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> yes. You know God, and He cannot create Himself. You know how God rested? Was that more of an example for His creation rather than? Right. Himself? Very good. when he hallowed the Sabbath day, the seventh day, and then he rested, right? What do we mean by God rested? So clearly, he continued to uphold the universe by the word of his power. He didn't cease to meticulously order all things in creation or else everything would fall apart. If God stopped ordering all things by his providence, there would be no order in the universe. So what we mean there is he rested from his initial creative act. Now, Properly speaking, everything that materially exists, if you will, has already come into existence. We're not creating actual new matter, okay? Matter already exists. We're fashioning it, we're molding it, we're burning it, we're turning it into something else, we're doing all of that stuff. So God's miraculous, once for all, creative work happened, okay, at creation, and then he ceased from that created work and because it was already all done. The creation was complete and it was very good. That being said, God is still God. God is still creator. Can he, if he wants to, create new matter miraculously? Right? Of course he can. He can do that if he wants to. But that's what we mean when God ceased from his six days of creation. Creative works. Without getting into the debate about the nature of the soul, yeah. Mm, okay, yes. And, and I do take the position that um, when a child is conceived, a new soul 
is created and body and soul are united at conception. It's a whole person, it's a whole human. Um, yeah, I guess if you get super technical, in that sense, God is still creating souls. God is still creating. But when we speak of the initial creation act being complete, we're saying that, okay, at the very least, when it comes to humanity, since you're talking about humanity, in that sense, humanity is already created in the loins of Adam. And therefore, there's already a real representation of Adam as the head over humanity standing before God. And that's already done and dusted. Yeah. How do we reconcile like, the idea of God's like, individuality, singularity, with like, the eternal generation of the Son? Like, the idea of like, generation... Okay, chapter 3, we'll get there. Okay. All right. Well, that's easy. Oh, so simple. Yes. <laughs> we'll get there. Chapter 3. Yes. I mean, sorry, paragraph 3. Okay. We're getting into the aliens. I knew it would happen. Yes. I know what you mean. Mm, yes. Ooh, that's good. Yes. Echad is the Hebrew word. Um, it can, some exegetes, you know, would press this a lot. It can speak of a composite whole, like one bundle of grapes or one basket of fruit. Um, but yeah, the oneness is reflected, yeah, yeah, in so many ways in creation. This is so true. Um, great. Now, now, all of that being said, let's not forget that because this God is so great, He is, let us see, incomprehensible. The incomprehensibility of God. Speaking of the very essence of God, it says, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but Himself. So, Here's a question for all of you. Is God knowable? Knowable. Not N-O-A-H. No. Knowable. Can you actually know God? Well, yes. And we made that very clear even through general revelation as we studied chapter 1 of the confession. But can you fully comprehend all that God is? Yeah, exactly. And even in eternity, we will just for all eternity, continue to grow in our knowledge of God, right? It's not that we enter the new creation and all of a sudden we know of everything of God. No, there's an actual life that is to be lived for eternity, growing in our knowledge of God. And it's never going to stop because going um, to the, the next a couple ones later of his infinitude. He's infinite. There, there is never an end to knowing more of who and all that God is. Yeah, Josh. What do you mean by fullness of knowledge is what I would ask? No, no, no. A complete understanding of God? Maybe not necessarily God, but let's say everything around him. I reckon he doesn't even know what's on the other side of the globe. Like, <laughs> you know, so yeah, he, no, he did not have like a complete, almost omniscient kind of knowledge of all creation and things. He even, he probably, he, he learned, you know, he, he learned even from day one, like, what is that? A fruit. Everything like, you know, he's a creature. So, you know. Everything that, be, that we know empirically would also be what Adam would have to Yes, he, wa he wasn't like a superhero. He was still a very real human being. He needed to use his senses. He needed to grow in knowledge. He needed to learn. He needed to engage with things around him and put pieces together and so on. You're going to say something weird. Never mind. Do you mean? No, no, because you said on the other side of the globe. I was just wondering if you meant on the other side of the disc. <laughs> on the other side of the disc, yes. I did mean that. I meant on the other side of the disc, which is a very scary place, by the way. Um, were you going to say something over here? No? Okay, that's good. So, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, okay? So, what, what, do, we, um, what do we mean by this? It means that you puny little man who is not infinite, you are finite, you are a mere creature, cannot fully and exhaustively know the being, the essence, the it isness of God. I mean, when you even think of God, what do you think of? White light. Glorious white light emanating from a, from a throne like Isaiah. What, what do you, what is God? 
Okay? So it's so it's amazing how as Christians we can learn so much about God and we can like look at the world and like they don't know God. Oh, I'm so thankful we know God. There is so much to know and learn about God. But then when you like just go to the most basic thing, well, what is God? I can't fully wrap my head around that. I can't completely even grasp that. What do I answer to that question? What is God? God. And we come up with words like he is a most pure spirit and that is true, but that's not everything to be known about him. Um, yeah? Um, the the incomprehensibility of God, would you say that that's because he's, he's infinite? Would that be right? That's uh, one of his attributes, absolutely. We, can, we, we literally cannot comprehend his infinitude fully. Why, why isn't it put after the infinity? Why isn't it what? Well, because a statement is made that he is one, that he is distinct from all of creation, he is independent, and then as we get to know this one God, we know he is one, we know he is independent of all things, we also need to establish, even as we're about to speak of many of his attributes, that we cannot fully wrap our head around this God. It's important for us to know that it's a very humbling enterprise to do theology. It's a very humbling enterprise to develop a doctrine of God from the scriptures, right? So remember when God showed himself to Moses and he like, he, uh, of course, using anal- um, anthropomorphic language, he covered him with his hand because what was he saying? He couldn't even really bear to look at God. You can't see God. God has no actual form, scripture tells us, right? So that, that's this idea of, okay, so many things can be said, like why can't he see God? Well, he's too holy. He's too mighty, he's too great, he's too powerful, he's too other. You, 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 the, the, the eyes of a creature cannot stand to look into the very being of the creator. And even if he tried to, what would he see? It's a beautiful mystery. And God clearly is incomprehensible. Um, and we know um, from Paul's writing to the Corinthians that no one knows God truly as his own spirit does. And we're not into the Trinity yet, but God is one. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons. Um, No one knows God exhaustively except for his own self. If you could know God exhaustively, I'll tell you what, you'd be God. Because only an infinite being, a truly infinite, eternal being, can fully comprehend and fully grasp and fully know God. So only God has that incomprehensible knowledge of himself. Full. Ian? Um, You mean the Trinity? Um, I think one reason would be because that's the way that biblical revelation does it. Biblical revelation doesn't give you the doctrine of the Trinity first, then talk about the very being of God and his oneness and everything. Biblical revelation begins with with God and his holiness and his greatness. First verse is what? In the beginning, the Trinity, no, no, no. In the beginning, God created. So we first know him in revelation and even in general revelation as creator. So we must know him as this one God creator first and foremost as we follow biblical revelation, yes? Mm. Or, like, what do, we, what do we mean when we say God is incomprehensible? Are we saying that God is not knowable, mm-hmm. but that we can know him more? No, more no. God? We definitely believe he's knowable. Go ahead. Yeah. Because Go ahead. It would seem that, like, at least classically, a lot of people do, people who are aware of a lot of the speak on this, is that first and foremost, God is not knowable in the sense that his essence is not knowable. Uh, okay. Yep. So it's not even a matter of degree. Like even if we had an infinite amount of time, we'd never be able to come to understand infinity. Mm-hmm. Um, but we rather we know of him only by way of the kinds of things he's revealed to us about him. Yes. Yes. Related to and that's what I mean when I'm speaking of God as knowable. Right, so maybe we're just using it in different ways that he is knowable. What you seem to be describing of him not being knowable seems to be have incomprehensibility. 
So I would define incomprehensibility to speak of, to, okay, to comprehend, okay, to comprehend speaks of, to comprehend God speaks of being able to contain all that God is in our thoughts and to leave nothing of God unknown to us. So incomprehensibility means we can't do that. So yeah. when you define it as like, well, if we learn that God's loving, isn't that a part of God? Or like if we learn that God is all-powerful, aren't those parts of God? So like in terms of saying all that can be known about Him. Yes. Right? If we say we can learn about this little bit there and this bit over here and this little bit here, and that in that sense we're knowing God. Okay. Um, okay. We are defining him. We're, we're in some sense comprehending him. So, for example, like if you know about me, oh, I'm Canadian. That's an element of who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, or you know that I'm six feet tall. Well, that's an element of who I am. Yeah. Um, but what we're not saying, I'm not, this is not what you're saying, what we're not saying is that we know God, but we come to know certain attributes about God mm. that are um, different attributes. And that's what we mean when we say we can know more about God. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because you might say that those things are a part of me, right? So the, the, these elements of whatever makes God to be himself, these things are him, right? Because God is simple. Everything that things on is God. Um, so it's, uh, and this partly ties into the doctrine of divine simplicity. Mm-hmm. Which, yep. Which we're going to talk about. Correct. But in terms of even, I mean, one way you can describe this, is when we as humans think, we think we think in terms of parts mm-hmm. or composites. So when I say that, for example, when I say um, Josh is a pastor, I'm using three distinct notions. So Josh, notion one, is, which is existence, it's another uh, notion, and then pastor, it's a third notion. So all of our thinking always involves parts. We can never, ever, ever know, the sky is green. That's three parts. So, or green and blue and whatever. So, our thinking is irreducibly composite of those parts. Yep. And so that's why even, like, in principle, we could never grasp God because God doesn't Correct. have parts. He doesn't relate to, he, it's not that God and his existence and his goodness are three different things. Mm-hmm. They're all one. Right. And that's why we can't actually know that. Yes. Yes, and yeah, that, that is what we, we would be meaning by incomprehensible. Uh, knowing usually, you know, in the way that I use it, in the way that we talk about knowing God, or uh, there's a book called Knowing God, uh, right? Um, is he knowable? Does he reveal himself? Can you actually have a relationship with him? Or is he so transcendent that he cannot come close to his creatures and have a relationship with them? Uh, in that sense, of course, God is knowable. But yes, the doctrine of incomprehensibility, meaning that uh, we cannot ever truly comprehend all that God is. His infinite, perfect self-existence, yes? Could you just please very quickly explain the way of negation and the importance yeah. of analogy? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're about to get there. Um, the, the, the via negativa, or the way of negation, that is a very old school and very helpful way of doing theology proper, or the doctrine of God. And be, here's, here's what it means. Because God is so high and lofty and incomprehensible in His essence, theologians have found historically that it is often easier to tell you what God isn't as opposed to tell you what God is. Because when you say, what is God? God is God. He is who He is. But you know know what can be easier just to help us to to know more about this God is to tell you what He isn't. He isn't a creature. He isn't made up of parts. And that's where we get to now, letter D, spirituality. He is a most pure spirit, invisible, and here's some negation, without body, parts, or passions. Without body, parts, or passions. Um, He is a most pure spirit, first of all, which means that, well, Jesus says it best, God is spirit, and he is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and 
in truth. God's being is spirit. He is not a material being. He doesn't have a material form. God is spirit. So God is obviously distinct from the material realm, right? Um, and yeah, so he, he, is not, he is not like one of us. You can say so many things about what he is not. He is invisible, okay? So that just kind of adds on to it. Clearly, he is without body, okay? So here's a question, guys. What do you do with those passages in the Bible that speak of Nehemiah having the hand of God upon him, or Ezra, sorry, having the hand of God upon him, or spreading, uh, going under the covering of God's wings and things like that? We've talked about this a little bit before. What do you do with those passages? It sounds like God has a body. Yeah, it's language of accommodation. God is accommodating himself. We say that he's using anthropomorphic language. We are mere humans, mere creatures. So we can't help but speak of God in creaturely ways, right? He doesn't have an actual body. He is without body and he is without parts. Okay, so you could even read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, right? Um, some would read that and speak of, really, the, the oneness of God, the, the fact that God is simple, right? He's not comprised of complex parts. So this is something that um, our brother was starting to talk about earlier, the doctrine of simplicity, divine simplicity. So let me, let me help us out to see how unique and distinct God is from all of his creatures, right? And we, we were starting to talk about this. Anything, any creature is comprised of parts. You have body parts, you have body and soul, you have all kinds of parts. What does that mean, okay? Your existence as what you are, Caleb, is dependent upon these parts. Um, and only with these parts coming together are you able to be what you are, which is, is Caleb, right? So why is it that we cannot say that God is, he has a head part, he has a hand part, a body part. He has a love part. He has a, a, a justice part. Why can't we speak of God in terms of parts, right? Well, because God is self-existent. To say that God is comprised of parts would make the very being and existence of God dependent upon those individual parts. So we're, we're really starting to understand the incomprehensibility of God now because there is literally nothing in creation that is like this truly, at least in our human experience. You cannot just look around and find something that goes, this doesn't have any parts. No, it all has parts. Even just think about the molecules. The molecules that come together in order to, for this cup to have this physical form, right? God isn't comprised of molecules. He simply is all that he is. Or as the statement goes, all that is in God is God. Yeah. Keeping that in mind, how appropriate then would it be to say Christ is the love of God or the wisdom of God? Or yep. Well, you know what's interesting about that is that, that that is such a beautiful thing that God does because in the incarnation, the God becomes man. God becomes man and man has parts. And Christ has parts. He enters into the human existence very much like that. And that's why we're able to even more speak of God in that language of closeness to humanity, engaging with humanity, relating with humanity in those very special ways. Because yes, God is love, but it is manifested to us relationally through a very real person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who actually comes to us in the flesh. And yes, he does have parts. No, very good, sure, yes. He assumes parts, yes. He subsumes to himself a human nature. I think, uh, I'm trying to, no. How, assumes to himself. Is, is there, is there, what, what is the difference, what is the definition of the difference between the person spoken of God and God? For example, like, you know, if we would say Jesus in his, in his earthly ministry, he would have parts of the same human nature, etc. Yeah. Necessary. Okay, because... We, let us not equate the three persons of the Trinity as what we mean when we talk about human persons. Okay? 
When we use the term persons, and that's why older theologians have used the term subsistence, okay? Um, because it is true that we can accidentally put into our minds like three human persons, like three separate human persons, three distinct human per No, we're not talking about it. We're saying that God subsists in three subsistences, and we will get there in chapter three, and these are not parts of God. Why? Well, first of all, now, knowing now our doctrine of the oneness of God cannot be parts. It cannot be parts because the Father is fully and truly God. The Son is fully and truly God. The Spirit is fully and truly God. If all three subsistences are fully and truly God, there are no parts. There are no three parts. They are simply distinguished, chapter 3, by several peculiar relations and properties. We'll get to that language in chapter 3. Ah, uh, paragraph 3. Yes. Yes. No, no, he's not. He's not. God is fully and truly creator. And he is fully and truly redeemer. Right? He's correct. Yes, you could use the term aspects and stuff like that. And that's because think of the God, think of God as this amazing light. This this great piercing white light and all that is is light it's just beautiful light that's all that God is he's not a bunch of different things he is who he is period as we as creatures get to know God in the way that he reveals himself when God is made known in and to through and to creation it's as if this amazing bright light goes through a refracting glass and so, therefore, the way that we perceive him is there's, there's some pink in there. What is in the refracting glass? Who's good with colors? Hey, you're good with colors. If I were to put a nice, beautiful light through like this refractor glass or something, what, what would the primary colors come out um, through the other end? There would be some red. There would be some green. There would be some blue. But, th guys, this is just an analogy. Okay, this is just an analogy. So, we as creatures cannot help but see refraction and see, oh, there's love, and there's justice, and he's creator, and he's mercy, and so on. But these are not individual little compartments of who God is. God just is. And as he reveals himself to us, we see him for who he is in our understanding of justice, and our understanding of mercy, and our understanding of love, and all of these things. He doesn't have compartments or little parts that hold him together. That's what we're trying to say with simplicity. He is without parts. No. All of them share in the one essence. And all that we say about each person of the Trinity is true of the other persons. But there is a distinction in terms of their relations and distinct properties, especially in their works as they perform the works that God does in the world. One last thing I want to end with. He is without body, without parts, or passions. I did an entire class on this. You can just look it up. Um, confessing the impassable God or something like that. I forget what it was. You can look it up. We can talk about it some more, but the modern English is changeable emotions, which is true, it's correct, but it is subpar, that phrase. Most people would agree God doesn't have changeable emotions. Passions, though. When we speak of the passion of the Christ, we speak of Him undergoing. Something is being done to him, to Christ, that causes him to bleed, that causes him to mourn, that causes him to, to die. Okay? That's the God-man, though. That's as to his humanity. God, though, in his essence, cannot undergo. Am I losing you? He cannot undergo anything. Nothing can be done to him that will move him or change him. And yes, changeable emotions is one way. You can't do anything or say anything to God that will cause God to go from one thing into becoming one thing, another thing. So we're starting to get into the impassibility of God. This is what I love about this format of study. We're just going to stop. We're just going to stop and we're just going to continue next week. Yeah? Um, so God does things 
And if God is all that he is, yep. and God does things, he does things. Uh, uh, it, does that mean either that God is movement, is the doing, or does that mean that God is, uh, moves himself? N- yeah. <laughs> um, so when God is moving, when God is doing, we are using this language in the context of him enacting things upon creation. So he cannot move himself. Okay? He cannot move himself or anything like that. And he is not just mere action. right? But why? Because he does not go from... We have no time. He, is n- <laughs> he does not go from potentially doing something to then becoming that doing something or then finally doing that something. He is all actuality. He, there's no potential in God to become something greater, to become something more, to go from one form of being or state of being into another state of being. He just is. So all actions that we perceive of God is simply Him. He's moving creation. He's, he's affecting creation by His own power and being. Not moving himself. Yes. So, yes? Very quick analogy. Oh, a quick analogy. I, I bet you it's not quick. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so uh, the old school way of talking about this. Please. It gives you sunburn. Some of us get sunburned. Causes plants to grow. Right? So we can look at vitamin D. Us that are different and various, um, and, but they all have one cause. Yep. And so when we talk about the actions of God, for example, God is wrathful or angry or God is loving or kind, these are effects in yes. us. Yes. Yep. Right? So what we're, we're really doing is naming some of the effects, the diversity of effects, to a single cause. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, for example, wrath, right, which would be a passion, is not something that's actually in God. It is yes. only an effect in us. Right. So it's not God being joyful, and then you do something sinful and bad, and he finds out about it, and he gets up and he goes, "Why have you done that?" Like like some angry dad, right? When we speak of the wrath of God, we are simply speaking of this is God in all of his absolute perfections, his holiness, and then this is you, changeable human. You, you now do something that is an offense to God that does not conform to the goodness of God. And the way that that light now refracts upon you in light of what you're doing is, is wrath, is, is God's curses upon sin, it's God's anger against the sinner. Okay, so we're stuck at spirituality. He is a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions. We will continue next week. Let's give thanks. Father in heaven, we thank you that even though you are an incomprehensible being in all of your essence, you have made yourself known to us through the revelation of nature and especially your word. And through this study, we pray that we would grow in more intimate knowledge of all that you are even though even in eternity we will continue growing in that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.